Welcome, ladies. I'm so glad you're here for the study of Nehemiah. Um, I don't know if you're excited, but we're excited. This is a great book, and it's so pertinent for our lives today. So let's, let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given us your word. Lord, you haven't left us clueless. You have um, given us this precious book that is full of so many truths that we need to live by. And Father, we ask that you would help us to glean all that we can from this uh, book of Nehemiah and from the life of Nehemiah, who is such a, a testimony and an example to us. Lord, give us ears to hear this morning what your spirit would say to us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are in chapter two. Uh, this week, and uh, in the Old Testament times, cities were surrounded by walls. Jerusalem was one of those cities, and this was the city's defense. It was to prevent, they hoped, attacks by the enemy. Typically, these walls were massive. Some historians say that these walls could have been up to 15 feet thick, and 25 feet high. Can you imagine building that without all of the modern equipment that we have today, <laughs> right? So this was an amazing thing that they did to fortify, in other words, their uh, city. And so along with the wall, there were gates. And the gate was considered a fortified entrance into this walled city. And there were multiple gates along the wall, particularly in Jerusalem, as you read this week in your study. So these gates were also made to be very strong. They were made of very heavy wood, and they were reinforced with bronze and or iron. Now, gates in the scriptures speak and are often used as symbols of security and strength. So just keep that in mind as we proceed through this book of Nehemiah. So this helps us to understand why the gates were what Nehemiah was most concerned about and where the rebuilding would begin. The meaning of these gates, and there are a lot of them that you just were introduced to this week, but the meaning of these gates will be studied in detail next week in your lesson. So we're not going to go in that to, into that today. Now, as we learned in chapter one in the book, Nehemiah learned about the condition of the walls and the gates and the people of Jerusalem, and he became burdened by this. Now, we don't live in walled cities today, but we can understand the need for walls of Jerusalem to be built and rebuilt. So as we begin this study of Nehemiah, we're going to be able to learn some important lessons about building, not physical walls, but building our walks with the Lord and as a guide in service to our Lord. When we read and study scriptures, we need to look at how it relates to us. What can we learn that we can apply to our lives and at what God wants to teach us specifically? It's not just about reading a story. It's not just about reading a book of the Bible, but it's remembering that this is God's letter to you and I from which he desires us to learn and to grow. And as we look at Nehemiah chapter 2, we see some very important lessons that as Christians we need to apply in our lives. So we're going to look at seven specific things this morning, starting with Nehemiah's heart or burden. Nehemiah was living in the king's court in what I call a life of luxury, so to speak, if you will. He had no immediate needs. But upon hearing of the condition of the people and the walls of Jerusalem, he was grieved, as we read last week. There's a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus, and he writes this about the condition of Jerusalem. They were in a bad state, for that their walls were thrown down to the ground, and that the neighboring nations did a great deal of mischief to the Jew, while in the daytime they overran the country and pillaged it, and in the night did the mischief, and the roads were in the daytime found full of dead men. So that's pretty heavy things that were happening to the Jews and to the city of Jerusalem. So from what was revealed to Nehemiah that we read in chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, his face was very sad. So much so that the king noticed his countenance, and he described it as a sorrow of heart. This became Nehemiah's burden. We also learned that he took this burden to the Lord in prayer. Jesus tells us in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, to come to him with our burdens and he will give us rest. Oh, how we need to be like this, that we go to God first 
with our burdens. We're often... Um, wrongly go to a friend, um, our husband, or uh, some other family member with our burdens, but we need to go to the Lord first. And like Nehemiah did, we, learn, we need to learn to wait on the Lord's timing to move ahead. Nehemiah waited four months between when he heard the news and when the Lord opened the door for him to share with the king. I love that although this burden was heavy upon his heart, he didn't rush into his own plans, but he fasted and he prayed until the Lord spoke to his heart about what to do. What a tremendous lesson that is for us. So we're going to look at the second thing that we learn from this book of uh, this chapter of Nehemiah that's pertinent to our own lives, and that is prayer. We already uh, looked a little bit at Nehemiah and his prayer life in chapter 1. But specifically in verse 4, we read that, uh, So I prayed to the God of heaven. Here is a man who is surrounded by ungodly people as he is in captivity. They do not worship the God of Israel. And yet, in the midst of this, we find Nehemiah as a man of prayer. Prayer was his first resort and not his last resort, and it was something he continued in. In chapter 1, verse 6, he said, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. This is a man of prayer. 1 Thessalonians five seventeen says to pray without ceasing. This is what Nehemiah did. When the king asked What Nehemiah wanted him to do, his initial response was to pray to the God of heaven. He wanted to respond to the king as God would have him to. You know, so often when someone asks a question like that, we're like, we blurt out what we think we need or want without seeking the Lord first. He might have said in this prayer, when he went to prayer, Lord, what should I say? How would you have me to respond to him? What do I need to tell him? His prayer gave him confidence to ask for all that he did. And do you ever find yourself doing this? I call these arrow prayers. So I'm shooting up a prayer, asking God to do something for me in the moment. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Prayer at any time, prayer in all times. But we must have perseverance and patience regarding our prayers, as it says in that Ephesians verse. Sometimes the answer is obvious and quick in coming to us. Other times it means that a time of waiting for the answer. And that's the hard part, isn't it? Psalm 86, verse 6 and 7 says, Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. I'm so grateful that God is a God who hears our prayers and he will answer them. We bring them to him and whatever they may be. And we're reminded in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1, And this is what the Amplified says. It says, to draw near to listen. It's clear from our passages here in Nehemiah that he was in the habit of listening to God's voice. Now, while God very rarely will speak to us in an audible voice, in fact, I don't know of anybody who's actually heard his voice, we can learn to recognize his voice, though, speaking to us through his word, mostly. And sometimes he might speak to us through other people. The key is that we need to be attentive and we need to know his voice and desire to hear from him. And if he is to speak to us through the word, that means we have to be in his word and know his word and recognize, ah, this verse, this is what the Lord's answer is to this prayer. When Nehemiah hears the news about the condition of Jerusalem and the people, he prays to the God of heaven. So he knew God as the sovereign one, the one who had the power to do anything and everything about their situation. But notice in chapter 2, verse 8, that he refers to him as my God. I love that. 
So he knows God as the big God of all things with all power, and yet he knows him as a personal God. He doesn't just know him as God in a general sense. You know, people can say, yeah, I know God, and yeah, I pray to God. But he knows him as a personal God, and you and I can do that. We should know him in such a personal way with our communication uh, to him in our prayers. He knows us, he cares about us, each of us, and what's going on in our lives. And he desires for us to come to him in prayer and have confidence in him and trust in him to work in our lives and in our situations and to prosper us as he sees fit. Number three is plans. In this chapter, uh, we can read about in verse 7 and 8 and 11 through 15 some of the plans that uh, Nehemiah had. But even before the king asked Nehemiah why he was sad and what his request was, we knew that he had been preparing and planning for this work of rebuilding. While we see that he prayed to God first before giving his answer, there were specific things that he was prepared to ask the king for that had come from his planning. Proverbs 16.9 says, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. I don't know about you, but I'm a planner. I think ahead for what I need to do each day and for the week. I make a list. Yes, I'm a firstborn, as Lisa said. (laughs) So I make a list of all those things that need to be done. I think about what needs to be done first in priority, then what I need to do to complete each task, and then I methodically go down my list to accomplish it. Nothing is wrong with that, but what I can be guilty of doing is not seeking the Lord in what he would have me to be doing. I'm learning that I can make my plans, but I need to allow the Lord to direct my steps. I need to be open to any interruptions that he may bring my way and not see them as a source of frustration or a source of irritation, but as something else he wants me to do. Some of us planners are also controllers. (laughs) So again, God is trying to teach me that I need to let him be the one that's in control and allow him to direct what I do and how I do it. In other words, doing it God's way. Nehemiah was an example to us in that he prayed and he planned. He did both things. In this way, he allowed the Lord to direct his plans and to make him to know what he needed to be done. After all, what was Nehemiah? He was a cupbearer. He was not a construction worker, okay? So he was going to need to know from the Lord what he needed to do to rebuild these walls, right? Plans are needed. And God would direct him about the certain things that were needed for this mission. So he asked for and he received letters for the governors of the region, so he could pass through. He asked for and received uh, a letter for the keeper of the forest so he could get the wood that would be needed to build these gates. And then Nehemiah made his own assessment of the walls once he reached Jerusalem so that he would know what the work entailed. We can't expect to get much done in our service for the Lord if we don't have plans. A ministry starts with a burden, it starts with a vision by someone, and then they look ahead and determine what is needed for this ministry to succeed. And of course, it goes without saying, it's the Lord's guidance and his provision at the top of that that we are seeking him for. But there needs to be some plans and some some things that we have to do in the meantime. Nehemiah had been given a burden for Jerusalem and the people and then given a vision and plans by God on how to bring to pass the rebuilding of the walls. But additionally, it would require the people to have a heart to do the work. Nehemiah could not do this by himself. It would require faithfulness and diligence to complete all of this work. The tabernacle of God, I was reminded of as I was studying, and God had commanded for Moses to build this tabernacle according to his plans. He says, according to all that I show you, make it and all of the articles of the tabernacle according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. It tells us in Exodus 25. Here are specific plans and details that God has given to man to accomplish. We th- I thought about the temple also. We attribute the building of the temple to Solomon 
and that his father David had come up with the idea, had come up with the plans and the provisions. It was his heart to build the temple for the Lord. But we learn in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 that the plans for the temple were from the Spirit of God. So it was the Spirit of God who spoke to David about everything concerning that temple, even though he was not the one to actually build it himself. Nehemiah did not consult with man before he made his plans for the rebuilding of the walls and the gates. Instead, we read in chapter 2, verse 12, what my God had put in my heart to do. All of these are examples of God's work done God's way by his plans with people as he spoke to them and moved through them. Number four, we see in the life of Nehemiah, faithfulness and determination. So this is an example to us as well. His faithfulness and dedication is shown from verse one when we see that he was informed about the condition of the walls four months prior to what we read about in chapter two. He was faithful to continue to pray and seek what God would have him to do. And then in verse 12, he reveals that God had put it in his heart what to do. And he proceeded to move forward to do God's work. He could have been discouraged. He could have even thought, well, I can't begin this rebuilding. This is way too big of a project for me. Or he could have thought, I don't have the skills. How in the world am I going to know how to rebuild these walls? Or he could have thought, what am I going to do if the people don't want to come along with me and rebuild? But he was not discouraged. He was faithful and he was dedicated to what God had asked him to do. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. That's what God wants of us, to be faithful. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. No matter how hard the work might be, no matter how long the work might go on, he is with you and he will bless the work. Deuteronomy 10, 12 says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. This is what the Lord requires of us as well. And we need to be faithful and dedicated to this and to him. The next thing that we read about, number five, is opposition to the work of the Lord. What's found in verse 19 specifically. And we get just a hint of this opposition that Nehemiah and the people would face as they worked to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the, I looked up the word this morning. I hadn't done it yet, but i was just been mulling over opposition because I've just been dealing with a lot of opposition, mostly in my mind, about some things going on. And so I thought, what does that word mean exactly? The Webster's 1828 for the word opposition means standing over against, to restrain or to defeat. And that's exactly what's been going on in my life and possibly in yours as well. But let's first look at who the opposition is in chapter 2. We're introduced to Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab and the three of them laughed at Nehemiah and the Jews. They despised them and they accused Nehemiah falsely of plotting a rebellion against the king. These men it said were deeply disturbed that Nehemiah would come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. So who were these men and why would they care? We only learned a little bit about each one. Sanballat was the governor of Samaria, and he was considered to be very influential. He continued in this role to govern over the area, even after Nehemiah's day. Tobiah was thought to be his secretary and a confidential advisor. He was an Ammonite. And the Ammonites had come into the territory to occupy the land which had been vacated by Judah. He may have been, I read, a half-Jew. He is from a family which remained politically important through several centuries. And Geshem was a leader of a company of Arab troops that were maintained by Sanballat. 
He was from a ruling family of an extensive Arab kingdom, which included northern Arabia, the Sinai, and part of the Nile Delta. So that was a very huge area. Now, the the, uh, Samaritans and the Ammonites hated, just as a past and current for them, hated and despised the Jews. The Samaritans originally inhabited the northern kingdom of Israel. During the Persian period, Samaria served as an administrative center of the district that included Judea, which is why now Sanballat would be governor of that area. They were a mixed race who worshipped God, but they also worshipped the gods of the region as well. And this is what God had to say about some of them in Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever. So you can see why they're opposing the work of Nehemiah and the Jews. So just like Nehemiah and the Israelites were despised, we too will be despised. We will be persecuted, and evil things are going to be said against us, just as Jesus taught us in Matthew 5, 11. But we must not let that deter us from the work of the Lord, from our witness of him in our lives. Okay, these three groups of people despised and hated the Israelites. Satan hates you and I, and he will use whatever he can to keep us from growing personally, to being, from being effective in ministry, from being effective as a church. Nehemiah was accused falsely and unjustly of something that wasn't true. These men were trying to intimidate him so that he wouldn't follow through with this work of rebuilding. 1 Peter 4.14 says, If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. How did Nehemiah respond to this intimidation? His explanation was, God himself would prosper them, for they were his servants. You will not stop us, for we will arise and build. I mean, he was determined. Now, while we may see people as our opposition, it's really Satan and his team that we are up against. Ephesians 6.12 says, we, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I'm not going to go into the spiritual armor that follows these verses because we're going to get into that in a future lesson, but we are to fight Ephesians 6, 10, and 11 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We have to fight back, but we need to fight back with what God has given us for the enemy that is opposing us on every side. This attack of intimidation and false accusations is really an attack on our mind. It can cause us to doubt what we're supposed to do. It can weaken our faith. It might cause you to fear. And so this is why it's so important for us to do what it says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5, which says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself excuse me, against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Jesus reminds us in John 8.44, the devil is a liar. He is the father of lies and the truth is not in him. So take those thoughts captive that he will use to oppose you. Do you have the tendency to want to give up when things get difficult or you face challenges or opposition? We will learn more about Nehemiah and how he faced his ongoing opposition. But for now, let's learn from his example of faithfulness to God and his confidence in God and his determination to do what God has him to do. 
Point number six that we see in this chapter about what we can apply in our life is success is due to the good hand of God and that he's the one that prospers. We read about that in verse 8, verse 18, and verse 20. Nehemiah had confidence in God, and he makes it known that it's God's good hand upon him that he's been able to move ahead as he has. He acknowledges God is the one who prospers him. So, you know, when you look up the word hand, of course, it means physically a hand, but when it has to do with God, it speaks of his power and his strength. So God's good power and strength had been upon Nehemiah. And prosper means to bring absolute success. It means to flourish, to go well. And that's what God did with Nehemiah and would do with the Jewish, Jewish people as they committed to this project. Psalm 37.5 in the Amplified Bible says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him also and he will do it. So to prosper doesn't mean that you will have financial success, although you could, uh, or that you will be wealthy, that everything is going to go smoothly and wonderfully in your life. If you've lived very long, you know that's not true, right? (laughs) For Nehemiah and the Jews, though, they would be successful in building the walls because God had called them to do it. Deuteronomy 29.9 says, Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. I'm going to read a number of verses, but kind of look for the theme in each one of these verses. Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Psalm 1, verse 2 and 3, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The righteous person, as it's speaking about in this verse, which is the child of God, is prosperous in that they're always useful and productive to the Lord. 2 Chronicles 26, 5c says, As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. And 2 Chronicles 31, 21, And in every work that he began in the service of the house of the Lord, in the law and in the, in the commandment to seek his God, he did it with all his heart, so he prospered. Did you see a theme running through all those verses about being in the word, about obedience? For you and me to be successful and prosper, we have a responsibility to do something, just as we read in all of these verses. It requires dedication, obedience, a willing heart to seek the Lord, and knowing the word of God. Only God can and should be credited with the good and the success that's in our lives. And it begins with his good hand that he has given us what? Salvation. That's the beginning of his good hand in our lives, and it continues throughout our life. And remember, we did not deserve that salvation, so that's why we know it was the good hand of God, right? While God does prosper us in the material world, like he did with Nehemiah, we should desire for him to prosper us, that is to bring us success and flourish spiritually, for us to have a prosperous spiritual well-being. He wants us to do both. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4 says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We have all we need to prosper in this life as well as to prosper spiritually. What evidence is there that God's good hand was upon Nehemiah and the people? Answered prayer in that it was the king who sent Nehemiah to Judah. The king gave him letters 
in answered prayer for the governors of the region and a letter for the keeper of the forest to get the wood they needed. And in addition to that, the king sent captains of the army and horsemen along with him. That would have given him, you know, a great favor as he went through the land. It would have protected him. So certainly this is the good hand of God upon him in giving him things he had not even asked for. What does it mean that the good hand of God is upon you and I? What does that look like? It means in part that you are depending upon the power and strength of God. Remember, that's what the word hand is. So we're depending on his power and strength as you walk this life with him. For us to be spiritually prosperous, we are looking to Jesus. We are focused on him. We're looking to please him. It includes um, God using you to share your faith and the gospel with others either planting seeds or watering those seeds or maybe the blessing of seeing God bring someone to harvest through you. For we are his fellow workers, it says in 1 Corinthians 3.9. It is God using the gifts that he's given you to serve him in ministry. It is answered prayers and blessings that he brings your way just because he loves you. Number seven, the last thing that we see is a heart to take action found in verse 18. While Nehemiah presented his plans to the Jews, the priests, the nobles, and the officials, when he did this, they responded to support the work and they said, let us arise and build. And then Nehemiah records that they set their hands to do this good work. Is this your heart? Is this my heart? Often our words say the right thing, but we need to follow that up with our actions and our obedience to God. So are you willing to take action to rise up and build your life and that of the body of Christ? We need to be intentional in order to do that. We read the word, we study it, but are we applying it in our everyday lives? This is the action that we need to be taking, to purpose in our hearts to obey God, to actually do what he says to do. Building the walls around Jerusalem speaks about making the city stronger. So we need to be stronger Christians, don't we? On a personal level, the building means that we are to be doing what we can to grow in our walk, to be in the word, and to know it. And we need to be able to defend our faith. We need to be able to share our faith with the world so that they might know him. On a corporate level, which when I speak about corporate level, I'm thinking about the church um, regarding building. We're to be building others in the faith and walk in their faith and their walk to become mature, as Paul says in Ephesians 4.16, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. We need to encourage, exhort, and instruct one another in our walks with the Lord, rebuild, building one another up. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. So just to review our seven brief, our points briefly, number one, Nehemiah's heart is revealed as he learns the state of his fellow Jews and the state of their holy city. He's distressed and he has a burden now to want to bring about change. Do you and I have a burden for the lost? Do we have a burden for the compromised church, for our own brothers and sisters as well as ourselves concerning the disobedience and or compromise that may be in our lives and to want to rebuild our lives to please the Lord? Two was the necessity of going to God in prayer before moving ahead with our own plans. Let's be women of prayer. The third was Nehemiah's example of making plans and assessing the situation, and then preparing for how to handle it, but depending upon him, upon God, to direct him, and so we too, depending on God to direct us and not on ourselves. 
Four was Nehemiah's example of faithfulness and dedication to what God had called him to do. He has called each one of us to do something, whether it's in our personal walks, whether it's with our family, whether it's in ministry. Are we being faithful and dedicated to do that? Five was the opposition. There will always be opposition to the work of the Lord, either corporately with the church or with us as individuals. We need to learn to recognize the opposition and then fight it. Don't give up. Don't give in. Success, number six, depends on the good hand of God. Just that reminder, giving God honor for what he does in you and through you. And seven, that reminder of the heart to take action, which is obedience to the Lord. So I want to end with just two scriptures briefly here. Psalm 31, 19, which says, Oh, how great is your goodness upon, excuse me, goodness which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you. And the other one is Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Ladies, in our lesson each week, we are given a memory verse to learn. This week's verse was such an encouragement. I loved the verse this week, and it's an encouragement, but also an exhortation to us. So let's repeat it together, shall we, ladies? How many of you remember the verse, right? On the count of three. One, two, three. The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. Nehemiah 2.20. Thank you, ladies. So let's pray. Father God in heaven, we want to be like these Israelites who said we will arise and build. Lord, we know that there is unfinished business, unfinished work in our own personal walks with you that you want to uh, get to work at and in. So Father, help us to be submissive to your authority, to your plan, to your will in our lives. And Lord, that we would come alongside you, so to speak, and do what needs to be done for those things to happen in our lives, Lord. We, we can't just leave everything to you. We can't just say with our heart and in our mind that, yes, God, do this work. Because we have to come along with you and uh, put feet to uh, the things that you tell us to do. So give us strength in the inner woman to do that, Lord. Reveal the areas of weakness in our lives that need to be rebuilt. And, Lord, give us um, the ability to fight the opposition that certainly comes our way, sometimes on a daily basis, um, sometimes minute by minute in our minds, Lord, that we would learn to take captive those thoughts. Lord, we just pray that you would bless us, that you would prosper us, that you would continue your good hand upon us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.